Hello, welcome to Socialist Think Tank. Today we are lucky enough to have Ian Lavery speaking with us. Um, Ian has been very kind to do this, given that a couple of years ago my son hoofed him in the balls um, when we were at Red Hills. So, uh, you know, he's, he's a man of kindness and he's going, to be, uh, he's going to be doing an interview with us today in spite of that. My son was one, by the way, so he didn't really have uh, any, any malice behind it. How are you doing, Ian? I'm very good, thank you, Paul. Very good indeed. And thanks for the opportunity of, of coming on and, and having this discussion with you, particularly as uh, colleagues and comrades and friends and fellow socialists from the northeast. Uh, you know, I'm sure you're like me. I'm absolutely certain you're like me. The northeast uh, holds a special place in, in our hearts. Yeah, excellent. Thanks. Um, so, the first question I'm going to ask you is what is socialism to you? Socialism for me, it, it, it's interesting, you know, because I speak right across the country and I've spoken all over the world, actually, you know, like, uh, it's one of the things I do, I rally the troops, um, uh, something which I really, really enjoy. Very rarely do I, like, get up and say, you know, I'm a socialist, I'm, you know, I'm a socialist and this is what I, because I'm a socialist. Uh, socialism to me is, is basically the way that I've been brought up in a minor community, the way that I was brought up since being a young lad, we, we did not at the, at the time that, you know, our parents basically, the fact that we were socialists. And my mom and dad didn't go around and tell everybody they were socialists. Um, what they were, and the, the communities were by and large, the minor communities right up and down the country, by the way, or not just in the, uh, the, the northeast area, work in communities or socialist communities you know where people worked hard they, they, they played hard worked hard and they put the bread on the table and the clothes on, on the on the kids backs uh didn't have a, a great lot much more than that but had values and i think socialism really um without having a look at the the, the exact political definition but socialism is about how people operate within the communities in which they place to live, which within the workplace, within the schools, within the shops, within the, the just basically in the communities. And it's a way in which people value other people, which is important. It's a way in which if somebody is feeling down, if somebody's got problems, we try and help them, put them right. Uh, if people uh, have got great difficulties, then they can cry on your shoulder and you can then try and put them right. If there's issues in your community which is having a, uh, a damaging impact upon ordinary people, anybody at all, you fight, you campaign to try and put that right so there's fairness across the peace in the areas in which you live. You now people might uh, say, well, that, you know, that, 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 that's fine, uh, but they wouldn't normally identify that as, as, as socialism. You know, having an NHS free at the point of use in your community, where if you have an accident or if you fall ill, you can be looked after free. That's socialism, but you, you know, you, you don't get the doctor, you, you, you don't get the doctor's surgery, you don't get the hospital, you know, thinking that what a great socialist idea this is. But it's one of the best. Um, so socialism basically is it, it's about creating an environment where everybody is treated fairly, everybody is treated equally, uh, everybody has got access to those uh, most important things in life without any hindrance. Uh, education, of course, is something which is really employment, uh, important. Great and decent employment with decent wages, terms and conditions. Trade union recognition, trade union participation, uh, housing, uh, education, I think that, that I've mentioned, all of this sort of stuff basically is about fairness, or it should be about fairness, and it's about socialism. It's how we live and how we, as individuals, you don't have to be a member of parliament to be a socialist. You can, you, in the main, you're a member of the community in want to see and want to fight and campaign uh, at all times for this fairness that runs through the root of community spirit. That's what socialism is. You know, lots and lots and lots and lots of people are, are, are true uh, socialists without even understanding that they are. 
Um, and I think that's probably the point I would like to make. It's about fairness, it's about equality, it's about ambition, it's about core, it's about aspiration uh, for everybody, um, for the many and not the few. Thanks, Ian. Um, you mentioned there that um, you, like, you mentioned trade unionism there. And that's been a big part of your life, hasn't it? Being a trade unionist, and was that so? You you, you mentioned that you were kind of didn't really know you were a socialist growing up. You didn't know your mum and dad were socialists growing up because it was just community spirit. Um, but when did you sort of realise you were a socialist, and when did you start identifying with the word socialism? Well, you know what, I was uh, you know I was like a a mis I'm going to be very polite. I was a very mischievous laddie at school. Um, but but when I left school, uh, I, I then got a job at the uh, at the pit, and that's what happened. You know, my dad worked; he was a miner, uh, and I got the opportunity of a, a job at the pit. And, and not long after that, then the, the miner strike came in uh, 1984, 1985. But you know, when you work at the pit, the pit was the home of the communities. You know, where I lived, there was five or six pits just around the, the area. Um, and the pit was like such a such a place for levelling you, like bringing you back down to earth. If you've been out at the weekend and you've been uh, up in a good, you get back to the pit. You wouldn't need the policeman coming and knocking on your door and telling your father how bad you've been, you've been in, in trouble. You get, you, you, you know, people were policed in the pit by the miners uh, and everybody was brought down to earth by the most incredible people I've got to say. So, you know, when I got a job at a pit, it was an education better than you could ever get anywhere else. It really was, you can go to the best universities and get the best master's degrees and PhDs and whatever they are, you couldn't get the qualifications that you get from speaking on a daily basis to, to the miners um, and listen to what they had to say. Many of them, most of them didn't have any qualifications, didn't seek qualifications, but had that, um, that brand of intelligence, which I think so sadly lacking now. Um, and they, you know, whether it would be political, whether it be community, whether it be sports, whether it be whatever, um, you know, it, you've got great discussions and great guidance, social guidance from the people in the pit. I believe my education um, began uh, underground, not at school. My school days uh, weren't, uh, you know, I, I couldn't say that I was somebody who was stuck in at school. But once I got the, the job at the pit, then the, my education began in earnest. And apart from all that, Paul, was the, the, the National Union of mine workers, because when you you know when you work at the pit, then you, I, I did became involved with the 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 NUM. Uh, I worked at uh, Lane Mouth Pit first, and then I worked at the uh, the, the Big E, as it was called, Ellington Curry, just uh, a mile or so along the road, and it was phenomenal. What happened? Obviously, shortly after my employment, our, uh, our, our, well, the minor strike came along, and that's really, really what shaped uh, my career. Probably shaped my character. Some people might enjoy um, my boisterous sort of character. Other people might dislike it with a great, well, with equal measure, should I say. But, I mean, that's what that's what shaped me. I mean, you know, during the minor strike, we went on strike. We went on strike not for pay rises or increasing um, the, the annual pay for miners. What we went on strike for was to protect the jobs of future generations and the economies of the areas in which we uh, resided. That's pretty good, you know. We went on strike, we went on strike for a year to protect jobs for uh, future generations. We knew we were right, by the way. And, you know, being part of, of something, being part of a collective was so, so important. Uh, and being on strike uh, was, uh, everything about the strike was, was amazing. 
But I think what really shaped me was the, the argument, the debate, uh, you know, both for and against, because everybody wasn't a supporter of the strike, but listening to the debate, participating in the debate, listening to these great orators at the rallies, being, you know, getting your, your pals together, who you work on the cold face together, getting behind the banner, marching towards the uh, wherever the, the, the these fantastic orators might be. You know, I'm talking about orators of days gone by, which were, which, which were fabulous. Uh, you know, Tony Bain, Arthur Scargill, Dennis Skinner, uh, Rodney Baker and stuff. These sort of people were, were just unbelievable. And I think, you know, the, being together with your, 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 your pals, uh, who you work with, who you relied on as well, by the way, because, you know, working underground, you rely on these people for your life every second when you get down the cage, in the cool face and back up into the showers, you rely on these people. And being part of something, you know, it was just phenomenal. And then you, you, you talk with socialism. And that will have a look at a few points with within the, the trade union movement and what we did. Within the NUA, you know, we had the women against pit closures. There are women who, in, in many ways, haven't come to the fore. In many ways, have been kept back. I, I, I've got to be honest. But they, they didn't come and stand shoulder to shoulder with people. In, in communities like mine in, in Africa, cool town, that actually stood in front of the men and laid from the front. They were totally emancipated. They were absolutely fantastic. They weren't just, you know, making soup uh, or sandwiches for the pickets. They were actually on the picket lines. They were on the marches. They were speaking. It was, it was absolutely fantastic. Those that couldn't uh, you know, those uh, in, in the, 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 the areas where we, we live, those that couldn't afford to feed themselves, we made sure that everybody had food. Uh, those that couldn't afford, uh, some, you know, couldn't even afford to keep that electricity on, we made sure that people uh, uh, continued with, with electricity. I, I remember a number of times when uh, we got word that the uh, electricity board would have cut people's electricity off and we all went and masked to the house and prevented them from going, this sort of thing. Um, but I ju just generally, the um, the spirit, uh, how it brought people together being part of something really important, that's socialism. Man. That's socialism. Looking after the weak, the strong looking after the weak is probably one of the most important scenes, not just in trade union history, it's emblazoned on the banners, many banners, uh, as you well know, Paul. But it, it's one of the one of the most important lessons in life. The strong look after the weak. Um, so the, it was the minor strike, uh, the, the year-long strike, and, and, and following that, um, I, I you know, had a great interest in, in fairness, in equality, in politics, uh, and that basically means, you know, socialism. So I think what um, a lot of what you were saying there, it really resonates with me because you've spoken about community and you've spoken about friendship there as well. It seems to be me, to, to me, everyone I speak to in the Northeast who says they're a socialist, seems to identify friendship and community and looking after one another as being socialist qualities. But we've recently had a couple of elections, one in 2017, which, you know, socialism seemed to make a really strong comeback. And then one in 2019, when actually, you know, we seem to have, we seem to have lost our connection with Northeast communities. We've had people for the first time on low wages um, voting more for Conservatives than for the Labour Party under a socialist leader, under someone who's an unashamedly socialist leader. Um, where have we lost the connection to socialism in the North East, do you think? Well, I think we lost the connection um, quite some time ago, you know. Um, but we've seen a, a, a reduction in the support for the Labour Party uh, right from probably 2001, 2002. And perhaps before that, in, in, in communities up and down the country. And I think that was, a lot of it was to do with the direction of the Labour Party. 
um, the way in which the Labour Party uh, under the Northern, uh, well, sorry, the Southern Discomfort document produced by Giles Radici uh, simply said that, you know, you should just rely on the votes in the North because we haven't got anybody else to vote for. They're mainly low paid, they're mainly low skilled, but they'll vote for Labour anyway. So we need to focus on uh, a different different class of individuals. And I don't think that sort of attitude uh, helped very much indeed. But we're going to look at the, Paul, we're going to look at the, 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 the root of the problem in our communities as we stand. Many people will talk with the North East. Many people uh, haven't uh, had any decent employment since the closure of the mining industry, since the closure of the shipyards, since the closure of the manufacturing plants. Uh, it's all, a lot of it's been precarious employment. A lot of people think that uh, governments uh, of different colours are, are very much the same. And, you know, we, we, we have got to be honest, during the, 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 uh, the Blair years, um, the argument was the, the cabinet who, I think we had seven or eight uh, cabinet members from the, uh, from the North East, you know, at one time, they themselves argued that they couldn't be seen to be biased towards the North East, so we automatically got knocked back. Um, and, and then when there wasn't any on the, the cabinet, then we were suffering because we didn't have a voice. So we, we lost, we continue to loss out uh, on every occasion. You know, people have got the right to think who they should vote for. It's absolutely bizarre. There is an answer, by the way, but it's absolutely bizarre to even think that those uh, on, on low incomes, uh, mainly key workers, even would consider to support the, the Conservative Party. That always has been a white working class, um, you know, a few people who voted Tories all their lives. That's always been there and it's been right through, and it is right through the country. But I'll tell you what the main, the main issue was. In 2017, we said we would adhere to the referendum on, on Brexit, uh, where we had a record number of 17, you know, like that was 17.4 million people, I believe, supported um, leaving the EU. And we, and we said that we would, we would support the, the outcome, uh, the result of the referendum in 2016. 2019, we had looked for two years as if we were forging that issue. We didn't want to leave. We wanted to ignore the people who had wanted to, to, to leave. Uh, and we were not prepared to listen to what the, 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 uh, the membership of the, well, not the membership of the party, by the way, because that's quite different, but what the people in our communities wanted. And it had a devastating impact. Why would? So why did people vote to leave? And they voted because their lives are shit. That's why. Because they're on low paid employment. Because they've got to ring up in the morning to see whether they should come to work. Because they've got to respond to a text to see whether they're one of the lucky ones that have five or six hours that day. Because they had to claim benefits and they haven't, they haven't seen any light at the end of the tunnel for many, many years. Because they've been attacked as skivers, um, because they've been demonized um, but for, for different reasons. And their life really, really is sh has been shit for quite some time. And a lot of people, by the way, believe because this populist Boris Johnson says, we'll bring back control, we'll get it done, we'll bring back the laws. And uh, we, people flock to, towards. Uh, the Conservatives because they had a defined message and that was we are leaving at any cost and we're going to bring back control to your community for you. Uh, we're going to get rid of the immigrants as well. How many immigrants are there in the likes of, you know, East and Wandsbeck, Sagefield? By the way, I would welcome more immigrants into the area where I live and I'm sure most of the people in the North East would embrace that as well. So I think you've got the Brexit argument, which was huge. And, and I, I've got to tell you, Paul, I was the only, sorry, me uh, and John Trickett were the only two people fighting on the Shadow Cabinet uh, to, to say quite clearly 
that we accept the result of the referendum, no second vote, no PV, accept what the people say. And there was that warning, you know, there was a warning. We had statistics that we could lose, you know, 48 of the 52 seats, and uh, we weren't far short. We did a document, Paul, and I would advise people to read it. It's called Northern Discomfort. It was in response to um, Giles Radici's Southern Discomfort, which outlines facts and figures about how people in the North uh, and in the Midlands, by the way, uh, have been left behind. We're currently doing a virtual tour, me, Trickett, and Laura Smith, uh, called No Holding Back, discussing these issues with other people, listening to what people have got to say with regard to class in their communities. So, you know, when you look at 2017, 2019, we had the same leader, we had the same policies, but uh, much more in terms of policies. Um, which would have made people's lives much better. We, we would have changed uh, the, the lives of, of, of like millions of people, to be honest with you. Um, but I'm afraid uh, Brexit was an issue. I think Boris Johnson, uh, as his right-wing populism, was an issue. And the way in which the press demonised Jeremy Corbyn, who was a fantastic individual, the way the press, whether it be the, the you know the, the the written media or indeed the you know the the BBC, Sky, whatever, the way they they demonise Jeremy is this absolutely woeful, horrendous Czechoslovakian Russian spy, um, you know, uh, hated the military. All of this sort of stuff was absolutely horrendous. Jeremy Corbyn's the most inspirational, decent man i can say that i've met in politics he's a wonderful wonderful individual so that as a whole was brought together to basically fight against the uh, what, what we had and and people took the people accepted it and i mean even even as we speak today um low paid people tend to, to 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 support the populism of um of, of boris johnson so you talk about like Brexit and how people voted and things like that. I suppose there's an aspect of socialism that is listening and listening to our communities. Um, how do we go about listening to our communities in order to rebuild that support for socialism? For example, at the moment, I'm trying to suggest that um, we campaign on, on participatory um, budgeting at the local level and have county councillors say, right, I've got an AAP budget. You go and spend, like, you know, how do, how do the people of our village, how do the people of my ward want to spend that and actually bring people in and start helping them make the choices. Um, and I think that's a form, of, a form of socialism, really, allowing more people to be more involved. How would you suggest that we maybe can bring people along with this idea that we can build socialist society? Well, again, when we talk about building a socialist society, what we want is to build a society for everybody <laughs> that benefits everyone and, and that is it. Anybody left behind because they perhaps haven't got the the money in their back pocket that, that, that others have uh, and they cannot provide the best trainers and they cannot provide the best laptops and TVs uh, than, than other people might have and they cannot put the food on the table. We want to make sure that we build it fairer, more equitable society. That's not, it, it, it's not difficult, you know. It's not like Trotskyite Marxism, you know. This is like Pittman politics. And in many ways are the same. But it's just the way, you, you, you know, the way in which you try to deliver that. And, and what you've said about participatory um, council budgets, for example, it's a, it, it's, it's a, it's a, a really good idea. People, I think, what we've got to do, we've got to get back into the communities. There's always campaign and there's always unfairness, there's always issues that we can campaign on. I think uh, community organising is absolutely essential. What, one thing that people really dislike is when you just knock on the, on the doors when it's time for an election and tell them how good you are and what you aim to, to, to provide uh, in the next five years or four years, whatever it might be, uh, whatever election it might be, 
what we've got to be we've got to be seeing in the community on a you know a, a daily basis. We've got to we've got to pick up the fight for the the, the closure in the the hospitals, the the the, the horrendous state of the high streets, um, the situation of low paid and precarious employment, uh, and we've got to do that together with the trade union movements. Um, but but it's got to be done uh, in a listening process as well. There's got to be lots and lots of listening. Uh, instead of like top down telling people what they want and what they should have, we need to be listening to what people um, what they want in their own communities. And I think local authorities um, have got a, a huge role to play. Local councillors, town councillors, parish councillors, county councillors, district councillors, uh, borough councillors, um, they, they've got a huge role to play. Sometimes you wonder whether we're effective enough in local government because, you know, t t to be fair, we have been on the, the, um, the, the, the bad end, the horrendous cuts. And I think when we're talking about um, the, the cuts throughout uh, the, the UK, again, you see the Tory cuts in, in areas like ours are massive. Many um, councils in our area have, have lost more than 50 pence in the pound in terms of funding from central government. The ability to raise money through uh, other types of revenue streams is limited because of the demographics of our area. So we, you know, we are they fully understand that. But we've got to gain the trust of people in the communities. We've got to try and get out there. And the only way to do that, by the way, Paul, is by speaking to people, listening to people, being seen, being sensible, being there when they're looking to close a maternity unit, being there when they're closing the E and E. Being there when there's a reduction in the police uh, and, and crime is on the increase. Being there supporting local people, um, you know, we we we've got to like regain. We've got to regain, reclaim the the streets for sensible campaigning and, and tell people that you're there to support them. Lots of people need support, you know. Uh, lots of people in our communities need need lots and lots of support. Uh, and once you give them that guidance, off in hand. Um, then you're well in there, and I'm not just saying this to, to win back, um, like win back uh, the uh, uh, Labour uh, government. I'm just saying that we should be doing this anyway because it's called socialism. It's called looking after people, and that's what everybody should have uh, at the front of their minds. You mentioned there about uh, about council cuts. I have a little theory that uh, council tax has actually been a very long game in the way it's been named. So it's a national tax, but it's collected locally. And most of it goes towards national projects like policing and, and uh, other national projects. But it's called council tax. And it's higher for people living in areas like ours where people earn less money. So um, a band A property is probably costing the same in council tax in Wingate as, uh, as, a, as a band D property in London uh, because they simply can generate more, more taxation there. Um, I think that's actually been a long game by the Conservatives to say this is a council tax, your local council is to blame for the cuts. Um, and I wonder, you talk about like kind of communities and the way people the way people need to be and the way we need to reclaim the streets. I actually know during this COVID crisis, loads and loads of people who've been extremely, well, totally vital to the community, Labour Party members, and they've done so in such a humble way that they won't say, well, I'm doing this because, you know, it's, it's for the Labour Party, because they're not, they're doing it because they're good people. They've just joined the Labour Party for the same reason. So these really brilliant community activists have got who help people so much and saved lives during this crisis. Um, they're just good people and humble people. Should we be a little bit more, um, I don't know, should we, should we shout that from the rooftops a little bit more about how labour activists are doing good in our communities? Well, I think what we, what we should do is, is recognise the fantastic work that people are doing and are some really, really outstanding examples um, you know, if you look at, for one, you know, as I said before, aren't we traveling the country virtually? Uh, and one of the most outstanding examples is, is Broxter, uh in the, the East Midlands, where, you know, they've got a, a community hub, 
Um, people are coming in. They don't need to be party members. They're being fair. They're getting a cup of tea. People are listening to their problems. Uh, and they're delivering, you know, thousands of food banks. They're getting people's medication. But in everything that you would want from it, it like a decent organisation. And rather than shout it from the rooftops, I think we should just, we should be holding them up as, uh, as excellent examples, but we should be also saying to areas, other areas, this is what we all should be doing. This should be part of our remit as Labour Party members. We should be making sure we, we don't just have, uh, you know, a, a meeting of the constituency and, and listen to some fantastic contributions, but actually make a difference in these uh, constituencies. Uh, and speak to people, listen to people, and develop on what we've learned during this horrendous pandemic. And that is, uh, you know, lots of people are totally isolated. Pandemic or no pandemic, you know, lots of old people, lots of people suffering through mental health problems, lots of people who are living on their own. Uh, never see anybody from day to day. <laughs> pandemic or no pandemic, and it's, it's, it's different during the pandemic, and I accept that. But, you know, this will go on way after the, the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, as a result, we should be looking to develop what we've learned. Uh, and, and, you know, everybody in the, the community should understand that if they need anything, if there's a problem, uh, then why not just ring the Labour Party? Why not ring the CRP office and see if there's anything at all they can do, you, you know, can they help us? Can they get me medication? Can they contact? Can they contact on my behalf the uh, the the electricity company who are threatening us with, uh, you know, they're going to cut us off because I haven't paid my bills? Can they help us with, uh, you know, anything that 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 I'm terribly terribly unsure about because I'm terribly terribly isolated? People with mental health problems, or you know, it's increasing by the. By the minute, really, and it's increasing because people cannot even afford to live anymore. You know, we're living in the sixth richest economy in the world, and people cannot live. They can't afford to put the bread on the table. They can't afford to feed their kids. You hear all these awful tales. So rather than like say how brilliant we are, let we develop it until we become better and better and better. Community organising, fantastic. Um, councillors at all levels and we've got some great councillors by the way we really have um i think we need to have a, a, a real look at the uh, at councils and councillors as well by the way uh, because they are the they are basically the grassroots representatives in, in every community and we've got to use the councillors and we've got to make sure there's access as well for younger people coming through uh, to become those grassroots voices which is much needed and there's been much, uh, you know, much in vain, as you mentioned, uh, Paul, in, in the past four or five months. You mentioned Brockstall there, and it's interesting. I was on a, on a Zoom call with, um, with Stay Home for Labour yesterday, um, and Brockstall were on as, as an example, and it's absolutely, you, you're absolutely right, it's absolutely fantastic, but what they've got is they've got physical infrastructure. They've got a shock to base themselves out of. And they can use that for a variety of reasons. I think in the northeast, we've lost a lot of our physical infrastructure for the Labour Party. We don't, we don't have like our 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 working men's clubs are, are sort of going by the wayside, and there aren't any Labour clubs anymore. Do we need to reconnect with our communities with physical infrastructure throughout the northeast? Well, I think you know, like if you look at the history of this great area. Um, you know, the social life has played a, a remarkable role in, you know, our history. And, you know, people working hard traditionally like to, 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 to play hard as well. When I say play hard, it might sound they like the bet. They might go to the bet shop. They might go and put a better and go to the club. And I'm not necessarily, Paul, just the, you know, like the Sedgefield Labour Club. Um, now the social working men's clubs, that's what they were called, working men's clubs, CIU. Um, and you used to, you know, that, that's, that was the focal point of, of, of lots of political discussion. It's where people could actually enjoy a drink, socialise, talk about the things which I mentioned before. You'll sit, you could sit and you'll always have people 
Uh, Holden Court in the search for Blue Lights. I love them, by the way. Um, they'll play dominoes, they'll, they'll play darts, they'll play cards. They'll target hoop their greyhounds and their whippets and their pigeons and their leeks and their onions and their flowers. Uh, and then they'll talk about politics. And then they'll talk about your castle. They'll talk about Sunderland. Uh, who was the best? And then they'll reminisce. Then they'll talk about politics. Um, you know, that, that's what it's, it's good. It's good. You got into the pub. Uh, I mean, most of the CRU clubs, Ashton, where I live, had the most drinking establishments per head of population in the country at one time. Not so very many years ago, probably two and a half, three decades ago. Every every spare inch was a drinking establishment. Uh, there wasn't any bother, by the way, not, not a lot of bother, you know. But, uh, but that's where people socialize and in, were in, in, educated in many ways. Like I mentioned before, I was, I was educated by the, the miners themselves in the pit. They're the ones who educated me what's right, what's wrong, what's fair, what's unfair. And, and because we, we haven't got them, the, the pubs are completely different. You're going to have a pub now. Uh, if you don't want a meal, then you're going to have a pub where there's music blasts. I'm not saying that this is wrong, by the way. I'm just agreeing with what you're saying. The things have changed, and we've got to make sure that we, 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 um, we bridge the gap of, of socialising and education. Uh, and in particular, uh, community education, what, what people need. If you want the club and somebody come in uh, and, and you, you know, had a problem, it could be resolved by the club, uh, within the club, by the NUA reps who are in the club, by the other trade union reps who are in the club, by the club committee. You know, um, it's all gone, that culture. It's a massive thing to try and overcome, you know. And we, we the history and the traditions of, of our great region uh, that's a huge loss, and, and now you've got the, the younger generations. Where do they meet to talk about the, the issues of the day, to talk about current affairs, to talk about trade unions, to talk about how they were robbed last week on their paycheck because the boss said it just doesn't happen, and people very much are, are isolated uh, in, in terms of that. We've got to think of ways and means of encouraging people um, to, to pick up the cudgel and as I said before when I say reclaim our streets it might seem terribly dramatic I, what I mean by that is you know let we get back to being used to helping people for heaven's sake it's free you know and not when somebody's door and say are you okay give them a smile is anything I can do for you <coughs> I'll stop in the street to the to the, uh, the, the you know the individuals and ask them the, this sort of thing but it's the culture it's the Traditions, it's a history of our great region, which which we're losing. I'll tell you what else we're losing, you know, we're losing our dialects. Um, and I think I think one of the most important things in, in, in this region is the is the rich diversity of the, the dialects from town to town and village to village, you know. Um, I mean you can tell that I've had electrocution lessons, but um that, that <laughs> Uh, and, and it's it's just amazing. And, and what we ha what we are also seeing, all unfortunately, is um, when you look at these various studies and, and um, reviews by the, the universities and, and, and other organisations, or the fact that a lot of the brighter people, young people from the the towns and the villages, uh, are leaving for university. And I think it's great to give people uh, university opportunities. They weren't around when, when I was uh, at school, leaving age, and as I've explained, I wouldn't have went anywhere, even if I had been given the opportunity. Um, but the, uh, you know, the, the, a lot of the, the younger people who enjoyed the traditions that we have, shared in the traditions with our, our parents and their grandparents and our, our brothers and sisters, um, and a lot of them just come back to visit now. You know, they live in the, the metropolitan cities um I, I, you know i could easily say that they're part of the metropolitan elite but that's probably not fair they've, they've done well for themselves and that's great because that's what we want for our kids opportunity in terms of education getting on in life but it doesn't take away from the fact that that does leave huge problems huge gaps in lots of you know smaller towns and villages that once relied heavily on one industry or two industries which are long gone 
We've got to bridge these gaps, we've got to recognize the problems and we've got to develop programs whereby we just sit and listen and, uh, and, and try and try and bridge the, the, the huge losses which we have had over a period of decades, by the way. I'm not sure if this makes any sense, but... You're, um, you're making perfect sense to me. Um, as, a, as a teacher, there's been something I've been very uncomfortable with for years. And this was even, so I started being a teacher in uh, 2005 and Labour were in power. And I'll tell you what, that it was a lot better being a teacher then. Since 2010, it's, it's got worse and worse, a less and, le a less, and less diverse curriculum. Um, but there's, there has been this thing in education for a while where people talk about aspiration and people talk about, you know, um, almost as if if you go into a manual job it's a failure it's an academic failure for a school and schools are all pushing people into into certain jobs so the way you spoke about yourself at, at school you would have been considered in this education system a failure but then you come to the COVID-19 crisis and all of a sudden all these people the cleaners the refuse collectors they're all considered to be key workers so you know I think that I think as as socialists we need to be thinking actually you know people have got quite enough aspiration that aspiration might be to have a better life it might be to do something good it might be to go to university but we've also got to embrace those people who are doing these absolutely vital jobs and appreciate them and make sure they're well paid do you agree with that well let would take that a step at a time and that Talking about teachers because teachers now um, have got much more of a, a burden on their shoulders whilst in, in, in schools. <coughs> I mean, the, the, the problem, one of the, the main grudges I've got with life is child poverty. For I cannot believe how, in the sixth richest economy, arguably the fifth richest economy in the world, we've still got like millions of kids living in poverty. That means. Like into your schools, my schools, schools up in this country without any food in their bellies. And you, I, I could mention a million projects where we're spending billions of pounds, which would be much better focused on just giving our kids, you know, while littlings, while bairns, um, somewhere they eat at school. And you've seen the U turn only this week, or last week, sorry, on, on free school meals across the summer holders. Uh, during this, uh, this COVID pandemic. We've got a situation where there's more teachers leaving the profession than is joining the profession. And I, I always believe, um, not everybody believes this, that we, you know, we call it the teaching profession. Teachers are professionals. Teachers are there to educate the, the, the students at whatever age. Um, so that they become, you know, the um, the future of, of our communities and much wider uh, uh, far as well. But I think the fact that teachers now are trapped the way they are, they haven't had the increases in wages. Uh, every time there's a, an issue in a school, it's the teacher's fault. Uh, not about the leadership of the school. Um, it's the teacher's fault. And I've done a, a poverty survey in my area with the schools, you know, and teachers were telling me that they were um, bringing clothes in for kids, they were bringing underclothes in for kids, they were bringing coats and shoes in for kids, they were bringing food in for kids, they were bringing money in for kids, they were looking after kids before school and after school because of certain uh, pressures on, on, on families. Um, and that was all way above, you know, a professional teacher's peer grade. So in order to be a, a professional teacher, and I'm saying a professional teacher, all teachers are professional, and I support teaching assistants as well, believe me, they do a fantastic job. Um, it's it's more of a teacher stroke uh, social worker uh, and we've got a value we've got to value our education system and the very heart of that is is good teachers good leaders in schools 
you know, and my, is our city here, in my constituency, virtually all of the high schools are in special measures. Uh, and there have been, since I became an MP in 2010, at various points, and lots of the, the other schools as well have been in, 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 in different uh, stages of, you know, the Ofsted reports hasn't gotten any better, and I'm really, really uh, put out by that. Um, but it isn't the fault, you know, that's the sole fault of, of teachers, by the way. So I support the, the teachers one million percent, and I think the NAU uh, in particular have done a, a great job. Kevin Courtney uh, has done a, a fantastic job, and, and Mary uh, Booster have done uh, brilliant jobs during these very difficult times. When I simply say to people, you know, we kind of let these kids go to school and just say to the teachers, you've got to get in there, uh, regardless of health and safety, regardless of the fact that you might uh, contract COVID-19 and take advantage of your families and your families may suffer. What a load of nonsense. The five pledges by the NEU were absolutely fantastic and it was right what, what, what's happened. Um, what was the, 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 the other point, uh, sorry, Paul, that you raised? So, um... In, in schools, we've kind of, we're being forced into this academic curriculum by Gove since 2010. Uh, and it's almost like if you become a cleaner, you look down on it and, and, and you fail. But these people, like, you know, I couldn't do my job in a school without my teaching assistant, who's now, cl like, now classed as being unskilled because they get less than £25,600 a year, even though they're massively skilled. But cleaners... Absolutely, like you know, if, if you want to know something about a school, talk to the cleaner. Absolutely brilliant people. I love the cleaners in, in my school, and I think the way education sometimes is forced by government to talk about these key workers is like looked down on, like people who are stacking shelves and people who are collecting bins and, and cleaners. These are key workers. These are the ones who had to work throughout this crisis. They couldn't work from home, you know. So I think they deserve a lot more respect in our society. Well, what, what's going to happen? I totally, totally agree with the key, key workers uh, in this country. They're the ones that's kept kept the country uh, in operation during the, the pandemic uh, for the past few months. These are the people who deserve the utmost credit. But you know, you cannot put you cannot put bread on the table through clapping on a Thursday night. I clapped every Thursday night, by the way. I did. I had a, uh, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I went out with my whistle. I put a hat on. I did everything just to show me support. I got criticism uh, from people saying they don't want, they don't want support, they want money. And I mean, I, I understand that. Like, nobody needs to give me any lectures on that. Key workers are in the main low paid workers. Uh, and it's just a different word for them because you see, Paul, the hedge fund managers are making fortunes from COVID nineteen. The chief executives of some of these financial institutions in the city are making fortunes from gambling, uh, et cetera, with regards to the economy uh, during COVID-19. This country could not operate without the, the nurses, the doctors, the porters, the cleaners, the supermarket workers, the carers, the paid carers, the non-paid carers, the volunteers, the delivery drivers, the Asda, Sainsbury's supermarket drivers. Um, couldn't we, they, these are the people, the, the public sector workers and local authorities, uh, the people in the job centres who are dealing with the benefits because of the huge increase in applications. All of these people are key workers. They keep the country running. They keep the, the mechanics of this country, of the economy, of the social system within this country uh, in operation. And I'm going to tell you what's going to happen. Because we've seen Boris Johnson, we've seen uh, Dominic Raab clapping on a Thursday night, although that, that, that ceased two or three weeks ago, but we've seen it. Um, it, it, it it's gut-wrenching for me, I've got to be honest with you. You know, these are the very people, you know, the very people, have a look at their record. These are the people who have consistently voted against increases for low paid workers. These are the people who consistently voted 
uh, the, 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 for a cap for public sector workers, for the cleaners, uh, as you mentioned. These are the people who say they have got to tighten their belt. Uh, and let me tell you, the idea that in this new modern world, as we emerge from COVID-19, will mean there'll not be anything such as low wage employment as boulder dash. I can tell you what's going to happen for, uh, in, in, in a few few sentences. There'll be a, a, a focus on reviving the economy and refilling the coffers, and that'll be based on the backs of the key workers. It'll be from Boris and his pals. Look, you've done a fantastic job. Uh, you are brilliant, and we recognize that. They might even get a badge each or a medal each. But they'll not get a huge increase in wages. Anybody who thinks that they'll be rewarded with what they should be rewarded with is common decency. Increase in wages, living terms and conditions, trade union recognition, in good contracts. That's not going to happen, I'm afraid. And the second point I'll make is that uh, in austerity to the brutal kind, uh, it, you'll, you'll see a move to invest much more money in the NHS, but it's going to be private money. So contrary to what lots of people predict, you, you know, we're going to have a, a much better world here. Um, it's it's just not going to happen. We're going to have to be prepared. That's why people in your community, in my community, need to be ready for the challenge, uh, because we're going to have austerity to the brutal kind, and it's going to be against those people who kept this country ticking over uh, during the worst pandemic in in, in centuries, uh, and against the the cherished NHS. I'm sorry to have to say that to people because people might think something different, but just. Uh, we need to be ready, waiting, uh, uh, ready to campaign and fight against and oppose uh, what, what's likely to be installed for the key workers. I think, uh, I think you're absolutely right. And we've already seen that with the student nurses that they brought back to work. Um, and they, they, they asked them to come forward during the COVID crisis. And now they're actually unemployed again. You know, so they've been treated absolutely disgracefully and they were... They were the people who stepped up in the hour of need. So, yeah, absolutely right. So I'm going to finish off with um, a little story that I think, I think this should have been one of our party political broadcasts. In 2017, I remember watching the leadership debate. And after the leadership debate, um, there was a sort of leadership debate extra time. And you were on with Boris Johnson. <laughs> and uh, I think Boris Johnson probably, if he was in, uh, in the club in Ashton, probably a bitten off more than you can chew because it looked to me like he was trying to get you to punch him on air um he did a little he blew a little kiss and everything and you were you were telling him how rude he was now i think that was one of the most um restrained reactions that i've ever seen from anyone so i congratulate you on being so restrained there when he was trying to wind you up but i also think that that showed a very very normal side and it showed that normal people like you and like Laura Pidcock and people with accents like ours were standing for election in the in the northeast of England, people who we can relate to. I found that whole thing very relatable. So what happened there? Well, let me tell you, I mean, I've done, as you'll be aware, I've done lots of things, uh, you know, on, on, on television. Um, and, and one thing's important, Paul, is I never try <coughs> to hide my accent. <laughs> I've never tried to change my accent. I think uh, on occasions I'll try and speak a little bit slower so people can understand. My my accent is is basically pitmatic. It's from Ashton in, in Zilma. Ashton was once the biggest mining town in in Europe, one of the biggest mining towns in the world. And we've got different accents from village to village, and we have got quite a a, a dense type of accent quite different to most people. But I never, you know, I, I, I wouldn't want to change that. And, and I wouldn't want to change, I wouldn't want the, the, the people in the Northeast to start trying to change it. So when you get the, the commons, I think it's frowned upon, you know. It really is. When you when you get into the commons, when I got the commons for the first time, I thought it was a scene for uh, Harry Potter. 
It was unbelievable. It reeks of this privilege, you know, it really does. Um, and, and, and people, when they hear an accent, goodness me, that that, that, that just not up for it. Uh, and I remember, uh, you know, a number of people, particularly the females in, uh, in, in the Labour Party from our great region, when they got up to speak, and I was watching, watching across the benches, people like laughing and like, you know, basically take the piss at the way that the speaker was absolutely disgraceful. And I was pointing at them, by the way. And, and, and when I was pointing, they the, the realised that they the really should should back off. That time, you know, Boris Johnson, you know, at that, that time, you, 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 I want to like put it into context because I was part of the, the, the team there to, to speak to the press. And what happens? You're in the green room. I was like, honestly, that, that, that'll be like 50 or 60 television cameras. There'll be uh, 50 or 60 radio stations. Uh, and, you know, the, the, you've got the Labour Party uh, officials saying, right, Ian, this is your list. And they're guiding you from one to the other, one to the other, one to the other. So you're doing like, you know, you know like probably the, maybe 15, could be 20 interviews on the night, depending on. And it, you've got to be on your metal because it's what's just been said, like in the previous half hour from uh, all sides. And obviously the press is there to catch you out. They're not there to give you a free run. Understand all that. So the, the pressure's on. But what what was just amazing that night was Boris was one of the, the speakers for the uh, the Conservatives, and the way the press the, the, the press treat Boris is abhorrent. They love him to pieces, and anything he said, they would be there and. And you know, Boris, what he was there, never mind the he kind of get his hair cut, he looks scruffy in the comms at this point of time. Boris shuffles his hair about before he goes on interview. He's got this image that he's this buffoon and and um and it was it was quite quite disturbing. I, I really didn't enjoy uh seeing a, a leading politician act in such a way and being received in such a way in such a sycophantical way by the press that absolutely Dawn him. So when when I got on with him, I mean, I, I, my sole uh, job there was to keep me temper because I used to be a bad temper bugger, you know. I uh, probably still am at times, but it's probably not the right thing to do to lose your temper when you're live on the television when there's millions watching. And he was goodness. And I, I think that the, the previous leadership battle, um, he had grabbed Andrew Gwynn who is a good friend of mine, uh, the, the MP, you know, and thought he was being clever with Andrew, and I wasn't going to let him get anywhere near me. Uh, and what he was saying was just absolutely outrageous, and he was telling all the top ones. And then he comes and stood in front of us, and, and I, was, I was really, I, I've got to tell you, Paul, it took, it took a lot for me not to say, get the, you know, like, or I'll, you know, in our shit, you normally say, if you do that again, I'll knock you out. Um, you know, that's the sort of reaction you would get in the Northeast. If someone is terribly rude with you, I mean, you, you know, you don't like... Really but when when he stood by my side, and as the interview, interview couldn't with clues, he blew us a kiss. Well, I didn't see that, you see, because I'm like, looking that way, he was there. If I was seeing him, Blew me a kiss after what he had been saying. I'm not sure how I would have reacted because I'm not sure if I could have held me temper to such a, uh, a rude, um, attention-seeking individual like Boris Johnson. So it all could have been different because, you know, a lot of people are saying, Ian, you know, you should have done this, you could have done that. We could have won the election. Listen, if I had a pound off everybody who said we would have won the election if you had a deck them, um, then I, I would put it. I would invest it all in, in child poverty, and we, we could pay with sales for the, um, the 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 food for all our kids. Um, but it's it, it's high pressure. He wouldn't then, by the way, Paul. He wouldn't be head to head with us on news night because uh, that was the next thing. He says, "I'm definitely not doing anything with him." And I said, "You know," and I had a big row with him off camera, basically calling him a chicken. Um, you know, like who do you think you are? All of that. It was, it was, it was handbags, really. But um, 
I think it should, you know, you know what it did? Sure, it just showed the class of uh, an eaten, educated politician as compared to a comprehensive school educated man. Somebody who, uh, when they were two or three year old, were told by their parents and they wanted to be the prime minister of this country, somebody of privilege. Somebody who was brought up in a council flat, seven people in a two bedroom flat, whose ambition when he was two or three year old to be an ice cream man. Um, it just showed, showed the difference uh, within like a 30 second period. Uh, and, and I just think his actions were deplorable, um, really were. Uh, and as I say about it, if I'd have seen him blow me a kiss, uh, live on telly, the actions would have been, I, I would have reacted, I, I would have reacted negatively. I think you handled it extremely well, and I think yeah, I think you did show your class in comparison to Boris Johnson, and it just goes to show that working class people from the northeast of England do have a lot more class than people who've been born, you know, into privilege. I think uh, I think more people should have seen that. I don't think it went out far and wide enough, and I think if people in the northeast see that clip, I think they'll know exactly what type of man Boris Johnson is, and maybe a few people might think. Did we make the wrong choice voting for that man? Because we should have been, uh, we should have been looking for people like you in the North East and people in the Labour Party who were, who were like you, who they can relate to. And I think people like you should be at the forefront of, uh, of our campaigns. But I'd like to thank you on behalf of the Socialist Think Tank. I'd like to thank you for all your efforts and you know, giving me this time when you're extremely busy is really appreciated. And uh, thanks for all your work during the COVID crisis as well and for your, for your community because. I know Washington a little bit. I used to work there and uh, I know how challenging it is for a lot of people's lives uh, in that area. So thanks for all you're doing Ian, and I really appreciate you being on. Thank you very much. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Best regards to Laura as well. Oh, well, I'll pass that on.